Hello and welcome back to ECMath. Today we're going to talk about complex numbers, specifically taking powers and roots of complex numbers in polar form. So let's start with a problem that looks like this. Uh, we have a complex number in polar form. Remember, uh, so if you haven't seen the last video where I talked about polar form, I would recommend you pause that and talk about this now. Uh, or go watch that video now. We'll call this complex number, oh, how about Z? Z is a common number, a letter used for those. And we're being asked to compute Z to the fifth, basically, in this problem. Now, if you remember from the last video, let's take a look. When two complex numbers are multiplied, their arguments are added, and their moduli are multiplied. Well, let's think about what Z to the fifth here actually, uh, I don't want to call it Z1, let's call it Z. Uh, z to the fifth actually would be doing. Z to the fifth is z times z times z times z times z. So I'm really just doing this process of multiplying uh, complex number z five times by itself. So the radii are multiplied together when you do a power, and that works when you're doing you know two numbers. It also works the same when you're doing five numbers. So this is going to have uh, a modulus, or a, a modulus, yeah, of two times two times two times two times two, and then it's going to have an argument of, we'll put the cosine part there. That's part of the number, five pi over six plus 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 five pi over six. That is, we add the arguments. We add the angles plus i sine of that. And that's how we would do this power. Now let's uh, see if we can shorten this down a little bit. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 32, but it's also 2 to the fifth. And 5 pi over 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, plus 5 pi over 6 5 times, is really the cosine of five, color coding, five times five pi over six plus i sine of five times five pi over six, which is 32 cosine of 25 pi over six plus i sine of 25 pi over 6, bracket, bracket, done. And so that's how you would take a complex power. And what you notice is that the step I did here that took the most time is also the least necessary step. Because once I recognize that I'm just adding these angles, I could just go straight to multiplying. And once I recognize that I'm multiplying the moduli, I could just go straight to the exponent. And that brings us to a theorem that we call de Moivre's theorem. And DeMoss theorem says this, when you take the power of a complex number, the angle is multiplied by the exponent. The modulus is raised to the power of that exponent. Mm -hmm. And let's see if we can write that as a kind of theorem. So I might write that z to the n is going to have radius r to the n times the cosine of n theta plus i sine of n theta. That is, we take the radius and raise it to that exponent, we take the angle and we multiply it by that exponent. And that's just because uh, of how the angles are added as you move around in the complex plane. Let's use that idea to try a problem. So let's try uh, negative 1 plus i to the fourth power. So I like to sketch these out. You don't technically need to, but I like to. So that's going to be up here in the third quadrant. It's going to have a radius of square root of 2 because it's a 1, 1 root 2 triangle. And it's going to have an angle of 135 degrees, or I'm going to call it 3 pi over 4. Okay. Uh, so then z to the fourth, I'm going to call this number z, z to the fourth will have radius uh, r to the fourth, which substitutes for square root two to the fourth, 
and then cosine of 4 times 3 pi over 4. Uh, or was this really four, cosine of 4 theta plus i sine of 4 theta? When you substitute in the actual theta, it becomes cosine of 4 times 3 pi over 4 plus i sine of 4 times 3 pi over 4. Let's simplify some stuff down. Square root of 2 squared is 2 times uh, squared again is 4. So this is 4. Cosine of 4 times 4 is reduces out, so this is 3 pi plus i sine of 3 pi. Now in the last problem, I left that angle as blah, 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 25 pi over 6, and I, I didn't go further. But in this one, I do want to go further, and the reason is that I, I recognize that 3 pi is uh, the same as a nice flat 180 degree angle. So the cosine of 3 pi is equal to negative 1 and the sine of 3 pi is equal to 0. So all together, this is just 4 times negative 1 plus 0, or the number 4. And that was, like, really not that bad. Um, I don't always encourage this, but you can ask your calculator to check for you. Uh, the imaginary number key is right above the uh, little decimal dot. It's a little i down there. And as long as you're very careful with parentheses, you can do this. Negative 1 plus, I'm going to do second decimal, get the i. And you can raise that to the fourth power. You can raise that to any power you want. And we get 4 minus 8 e to the negative 13 i. So our, our calculator is actually a little less precise than uh, I have been, although I now realize I dropped a negative. Um, that should be negative 4. But that's what 4 times negative 1 is. Um, but your calculator is saying, oh, where is she? Uh, this is 4 minus 8 times 10 to the negative 13 i. So that's basically 0. Your calculator doesn't know. Uh, it's approximating. So when you see that, just know that it's approximating, that that's really 0 or really negative 4. And by the way, just as a pro tip, if you are doing something on a test and you're asked to show your work and this is the answer you give me, it immediately, or, or any teacher, it immediately tells us that you have no idea what's going on and you're just pressing buttons. So please don't do that. Um, know what's happening when, when you see those approximations. Okay, calculator away. So that's how to compute a complex power. Uh, let's do something else. Let's do another one. Uh, we'll talk about roots in just a second. I want to do one more, one more power, one more exponent first. Um, because I think it's really important if you're going to compute a complex root, which is the thing that folks find the most challenging in this entire section, you have to be able to do powers before you can do roots, right? You're doing normal numbers. You learn how to cube things before you learn how to take the cube roots of things. It, it's basically impossible to do in that in the opposite order. So uh, it's going to be the same with these complex numbers. So let's look at another problem. I'm doing negative 1 plus i root 3 to the third. What is this one going to look like? Mm -hmm. It's going to be negative 1, and it's going to be up here. Oh, there. It's going to be up here like this. So that's going to have a radius of 2, and it's going to have an angle of 2 pi over 3. All right, so if I'm going to compute z to the third here, then it's going to have radius of 2 to the third. So I'm going to speed things up a little bit. I'm looking at this third and bring, making a 2 to the third, and it's going to be... Uh, times cosine of 3 times 2 pi over 3. And again, that 3 is because I'm doing a third power, so that's where the 3 comes in. Plus i sine. Now, I know what 3 times 2 pi over 3 is. That's just 2 pi. And this is also just 2 pi. So this is really just 8. Cosine of 2 pi is 1 plus sine of 2 pi is 0, 0 i, or just equal to 8. Hooray! So we've successfully kind of uh, cubed a complex number, but I want to talk about what we actually just did. We just found a number, z, such that 
z to the third is equal to 8. Can you think of any other number z such that z to the third is equal to 8? How about 2? It's true that 2 to the third is equal to 8. Oh, interesting. And if I had asked you up until about now, what is the cube root of 8? That is the root with a little index and an 8 underneath. You would have told me, oh, Mr. Eck, I know that. I know that. It's 2. And I would say, why is that 2? And you'd tell me, because 2 to the third is 8. But now something interesting has happened. There are more cube roots of 8, because it is also true that negative 1 plus i root 3 to the third. equals 8, which means that at least in some sense, oh, can't see that, at least in some sense, that is also a cube root of 8. And there is a little sort of weird sense where uh, this might be a cube root of 8 to a, a mathematician who knows complex numbers, but to a normal person walking down the street, they'd be like, no, the answer is 2. And it's kind of like, remember when I asked you, you know, what's the square root of, uh, not two, uh, what's the square root of four? We talked about how the answer is really two uh, positive. And if I want you to think about negative two, I have to write something like negative root four. It's the, the principal root rule. However, when you're solving the equation, uh, x squared equals four, there are two answers. So if you think about what we're, we're kind of, how I rephrase, so this is that right related idea. If you think about what we're doing here, when I talk about the equation z to the third equals eight, and I'm finding the solutions for it, I'm basically finding the cube roots, but I am asking it in a slightly different way. Um, so I think it's still probably fair to say that the cube root of eight is, uh, you know, is two, unless, unless, you see, like your book says, where they ask, what is the complex cube root of 8? And in that case, then I would be looking for all the other complex cube roots. And you'll notice, uh, let me scroll down a little bit to some problems. They're there. You notice that, that that is what your book does, right? They say, what are the complex cube roots of 20, this number? What are the complex fifth roots of that number? We're going to do both of those at the end of this video. Um, but we have to do some other problems first. But also, there's another really important related idea, and it's the fundamental theorem of algebra. If you don't remember the fundamental theorem of algebra, what it says is that any equation has the same number of solutions, or any polynomial equation, has the same number of solutions as its uh, degree in the complex plane. So if we're finding the complex roots of something, then that says, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that the z to the third equals 8 has three solutions if we're looking at complex numbers. We found two of them. Here's one, here's the next. So the question becomes, when we're finding these cube roots of 8, how do you find all of them? It's unfortunately not as simple as when we're solving x squared equals 4. You just put a plus or minus on the thing. In fact, is negative, uh, negative 2 to the third is negative 8. So that's not a cube root. So it's not only is it not as simple as putting a plus or minus on it, plus or minus doesn't even work. So we're looking somehow for three complex solutions, and oh, what a mess. But there's something that we can look at in the work we did here with the 1 plus i root 3 that explains kind of how we can find all the other solutions as well. Notice what happened when I computed the angle of this number. I ended up doing 3 times 2 pi over 3, and I got 2 pi. Since 2 pi is coterminal to 0, then the 
sine and cosine reduced down to have the same sine and cosine as the angle zero. If you look at what happened when you cube this number, remember that when you cube a number, you are multiplying its angle. So we had its angle, we multiplied it by one, two, three, and that got us back to two pi. When you think about the original solution of, where is it, eight, or no, two, we're looking at the cube roots of eight, two, what's the angle at two? Well, it's just zero, the theta is zero. So we had zero, two pi. What if there was another solution that resulted from going around the circle, there was some angle out somewhere over here, such that if we went around the circle once, we would land around here and we went around again. I clearly didn't draw this very well to scale. We would get back to the uh, two pi mark or the zero mark, but instead of being zero or two pi, it would be at four pi. If I could get the angle inside of here to be four pi, then I could find the other root. Hmm. By the way, there is a formula for this and we are gonna show it to you but I just want to kind of logically think through it first because I, I think you don't need the formula and if you leap too quickly to a formula it, it can kind of mess you up. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this stuff. I don't know where that went, but oh, over here. Let's get rid of that stuff and see if I can find the other angle. So I need z so i'm finding the last root of eight so i need some z such that z to the third will be two to the third cosine of m plus i sine of m and I need the m to be either 0, 2 pi, or 4 pi. But what's going on in the m? Well, when I do z to the third, I'm taking some angle and multiplying it by 3. So I need some angle that when I multiply it by 3, I get 4 pi. So I'm kind of almost solving the equation 3 theta equals 4 pi. How do I solve that? I divide by 3. And I get 4 pi over 3. So at the angle, 4 pi over 3, which would be the, the you know, original angle of my last root, when I multiply that by 3 because of De Moivre's theorem, and I take the 2 to the third power, I end up with, well, let's simplify this down, 8 times cosine of 4 pi, there it is, plus i sine of 4 pi. Sine of 4 pi is still 0, cosine of 4 pi is still 1, so this is just equal to 8. So I've seen like I've found another number, and now maybe I should just translate that back into um, normal trig town. So at the angle 4 pi over 3, uh, when I say normal trig town, I mean rectangular coordinates. I don't know why I called why I've come up with these weird names for it. 4 pi over 3 would be down here. With a radius of 2, then this would have a negative root 3 and a negative 1. So it looks like the number, just by sketching it out, would be uh, negative 1 plus uh, or minus root 3i. And I actually want to check this. How can I check? I'm going to ask your calculator. Negative 1 minus, it's not going to be precise is my guess because I'm doing a square root. So I'm going to get an approximation. But what happens if I take this to the third? Do I get something really close to 8? Well, I guess because the complex part dropped out. I do get 8. And so how did I know that? Well, I knew that because I knew that I needed my angle to reduce down to, to basically 0 or 2 pi. I'd already done 0 and 2 pi, so the next coterminal after that would be 4 pi. Um, and so it turns out that to find the third cube root of 8, I just have to do negative 1 minus root 3 pi. 
And here are the three solutions to x cubed equals 8. 1, 2, 3. You, at this point, your head may be spinning a little bit. You might be saying, what in the world happened? How do you find all these numbers? Uh, don't worry. I know when I did, I did this one in kind of a really disconnected way because we didn't even start trying to find a cube root, and we ended up finding three cube roots. So let's go to another problem where we're actually seeking out the cube roots of some complex numbers. And that's what we'll do with the rest of the video. Uh, we're going to look for some cube roots. These are, I think, so cool and so beautiful and interesting, uh, by the way. So, you know, it's, it takes a, it's a challenge, but it's, I think, really worth devoting the energy into understanding it. All right, so let's go ahead and find the three complex cube roots of 8i. Um, the problem tells you here that there are three of them, but if they didn't say that, you could also tell that because you're looking for cube roots. So let's call 8i, I'm going to do some notation. Let's call 8i z, just because. So I'm going to use like big Z as the target number. That I am trying to reach. Um, I also need to think about z in polar form. Uh, where's 8i? It's up here with a radius of 8. So this is really going to be 8 cosine of pi over 2 plus i sine of pi over 2. All right, so that's z in polar form. Now what I'm trying to find are some other numbers. Why don't we call them r for root? I'm not sure that that's a standard notation. You know, they probably use Z or C or something. Actually, wait, I'm going to use C. C for complex root. You can use any letter you want, though. And I know that there's going to be four roots. Nope. Three roots. I got ahead of myself. There's going to be three complex roots, so I'm going to call them C1, C2, and C3 for the different complex roots. And here's what I know. If they're cube roots of 8i, I know, and we'll focus on C1, that C1 to the third should equal 8i, or specifically, it should equal the polar form of 8i. 8 cosine of pi over 2 plus i sine of pi over 2. Um, I'm also going to do some more notation. Let's say that c1 has radius 1, which is the radius, and theta 1, which is the angle. Uh, I'm, I guess we should use the words uh, modulus and argument. I'm going to use the words radius and angle because I feel like it. Now, if I'm thinking about c1 to the third equals 8i, what would c1 to the third be? c1 to the third would be r1 to the third, right? So I'm using this, this Demov's theorem, times cosine of 3 times theta 1 plus i sine of 3 times theta 1. Right, so c1 to the third, in polar form using Demov's theorem, could be written this way. But I've also told myself that c1 to the third needs to equal 8i, which needs to equal uh, that thing in red in polar form. And I've now created a little nice bit of parallel structure. Take a look at this. The radius has to uh, be the cube, basically has to be the cube root of 8. And the angle has to equal... Uh, 3 times that angle has to equal pi over 2. So I've set myself up a way to find r1 and theta1. r1 is going to be, uh, well, I know that r1 to the third has to equal 8, so r1 has to be 2. And remember, the radii are real numbers, so we, yeah, there's other cube roots of 8. We just talked about that, but uh, we're looking for real numbers here, so that's why I say it's just 2. Theta1, I know that 3 times theta 1 has to equal pi over 2. So theta 1 has to equal 
pi over 6. Divide by 3. And I have now found the radius and angle of the first root. So let me take that radius and angle, and often you can just like stop here. You said, I found the radius, I found the angle, I'm done. But if you want to put them in polar form, uh, you can write that complex root 1 will equal 2 cosine pi over 6 plus i sine pi over 6. Putting it in that polar form, I, I think you should do that. Just if anything else, it's good practice with your polar form. What you don't have to do is put that in rectangular form unless you really, really want to. Um, you could do it if you wanted to check on your calculator, for example. That might be a good reason to put that in uh, rectangular form. Okay, so I've got one root. There we go. Let's find the rest of them. I know I said that there were going to be three roots, so let's look at root C2. I have a very similar structure, which I know that C2 to the third needs to be 8i, right? Sure. And I also know that C2 to the third is going to be R2 to the third cosine of 3 times theta 2 plus i sine of 3 times theta 2. Right, so the R2 and theta 2 just go with um, the, the second root. And I know that 8i needs to be written in polar form. It's going to have the same radius. However, when I do this next step, I'm going to do something kind of tricky. I'm going to write cosine. When I write here, if I wrote pi over 2 again and I solve, I would just get the same answer. And I don't want the same answer. So I'm going to think about pi over 2. And think about some coterminals to it. What's pi over 2 plus 2 pi? Uh, that would be, well, 2 pi, if I make that over 2, then that's 4 pi over 2. So that would be 5 pi over 2. That's the angle I'm going to put in for C2. 8 cosine of 5 pi over 2 plus I sine of 5 pi over 2. So I now have enough information to find R2 and theta 2. Why? Because of parallel structure again. I know that 8 has to be r2 to the third, and I now know that 5 pi over 2 has to be 3 times theta 2. So r2 to the third has to be 8, which means that the second radius has to be 2. The radius is going to be the same every single time, by the way, so you don't actually have to do that part over and over again. I also know that uh, 3 times theta 2 is going to be 5 pi over 2, which means theta 2 is going to be 5 pi over 6. When you divide by 3, it's like multiplying the denominator of the other side by 3. And so when I want to write complex root number 2, it's 2 cosine 5 pi over 6 plus self out of the way here, i sine 5 pi over 6. And that's the second complex root. Let's find the third root. So I have this idea that c3 to the third needs to equal 8i. I also know that c3 to the third in polar form is going to be c3, uh, no wait, radius 3 cubed times uh, cosine of 3 times theta 3 plus i sine of 3 times theta 3. Paren, paren. And I know that 8i should be expressed in polar form as 8 cosine of something plus i sine i, not t, i sine of something. If I put pi over 2 in here, I'll just get the same answer as I got the first time. Can't put that. If I put 5 pi over 2 in there, I'll just get the same thing I had the other time, the second time. I can't put that. So I need to do 5 pi over 2 plus 2 pi again. I'm finding a third coterminal way to arrive at 5 pi over 2 or, or regular pi over 2. Uh, so that's going to end up at 9 pi over 2, because 2 pi is the same as 4 pi over 2. So the angle I'm going to put in here is 9 pi over 2. 
then just double check for a second, you know, if you're not sure what's happening here, just double check for a second that if you evaluate this, you do 8 times cosine of 9 pi over 2. Well, 9 pi over 2 is the same as pi over 2, so the cosine of that is 0. Uh, plus i sine of 9 pi over 2. Sine of 9 pi over 2 is the same as sine of pi over 2, which is 1. So it's really 8 times 1i, or 8i. That is, this is just another fair representation of the number 8i. It, you know, polar points we did in the polar section are not unique, so I'm coming up with a separate representation of this polar point. Okay, uh, but back to the root. I know what the radius is going to be. It's going to be some number that's cubed equals 8. That's going to be 2. I also have this parallel structure that 3 times theta 3 is 9 pi over 2. So r3 to the third is 8, means that r3 is going to be 2. That's not a surprise. The radius is always the same. And 3 times theta 3 should be 9 pi over 2, which means theta 3 should be 9 pi over 6. That one I am going to reduce to 3 pi over 2. This the common factor of 3 pulls out. Um, 3 pi over 2. So that's going to be the third theta angle. And the third complex root is going to be 2 cosine of 3 pi over 2 plus i sine 3 pi over 2 close paren close paren and there are the three complex roots of 8i three complex roots of 8i in polar form and each of these obviously are just unit circle angles so you could easily put these in rectangular form if you chose to Okay, so I told you we were going to get a lot faster though, right? And like this was not very fast. I think it took about 10 minutes, and you don't want to do 10 minutes for, per problem. So let's think about though what was actually important on this whole page of work. Probably the only part that was really of critical importance was this, 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 and this. And everything else was just structure and explanation. So let me see if I can boil this down for you in a much easier way. When you're doing a complex root, you're going to, one, find the target radius and then take the nth root of that. That's going to be the same for every root. So uh, in the example, you know, we had uh, 8 was the radius of uh, 8i, and the q root of 8 is 2. That's going to be the radius of the roots. 2. You're going to find the target angle and list out n coterminals of that angle. I guess technically we're going to list out n minus 1 coterminals if we also count the angle as an angle we're going to list. So in the example, the target angle was pi over 2. But also, I thought about 5 pi over 2, that is adding 2 pi, and uh, 9 pi over 2. So I list out the three, uh, you know, smallest coterminals, inclusive, including itself. Um, and then 3, divide each angle by n n is the index of the root, we'll say a complex nth root. Divide each angle by m in the example. Then we got pi over 2 over 3, or pi over 6. We got 5 pi over 6, and we got 9 pi over 6, which we reduced. And then 4, your last step, is just put everything in polar or rectangular form 
depending on what the problem asked you to do. Um, but you know, once you've identified the angles and radii of the three or four or five roots, you're you're you've done the math part, and the rest is just kind of notation. We should talk for a brief second about your textbook, because sometimes I or what happens every year is I get folks that dutifully read the textbook. They get to the part on complex roots, they read it, and they get completely confused. They ignore everything that I've just told them and instead try to do this other thing in the textbook. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what the textbook says, uh, which is that the complex root z to the k is the nth root of r times the cosine of theta plus 2 pi k divided by n plus i sine, same thing, theta plus 2 pi k divided by n, close parentheses. And they go like, what in the world is this? What's going on? Uh, and they say, you know, k is 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 up to n. Uh, technically up to n minus 1, because it starts at 0. What in the world is this? Well, guys, it's the same thing that I just wrote in my steps, right? It says take the root of the radius, and that's going to be your new root, or your, your uh, new radius. Then it says, list out coterminals of theta. Oh, that's right, theta plus 2 pi k, where k is 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n minus 1. It's just saying list n minus 1 coterminals of the angle theta. And then divide by n is just what I said, divide by n. This formula is saying to do the exact same thing that we put in words right here. Um, and yet somehow, and you're welcome to use the formula, I personally don't like the formula because it ends up, you know, for such a simple task, I end up writing a lot of unnecessary kind of gobbledy garbage that I don't need until the end of the problem. And so that's why I don't actually like that formula, but it does work. Um, and obviously if you're in degrees, uh, that 2 pi becomes a 360. But let's, let's just do some more roots. I want to do uh, the complex fourth roots of 1. Hmm. How do you find the complex fourth roots of 1? Um, by the way, these have a fancy name. They're called the roots of unity. Unity like uno, like one, and roots because they're roots. And I just think that's a beautiful name. If I had a math band, that's what they would be called. Um, that's not a graph. I just know that there's going to be four fourth roots, so I thought I'd divide my space into four and find each of those in uh, a single spot. Before I work too much farther, I need to think about one. 1 is really the polar or the complex number 1 plus 0i, uh, and that's going to have a radius of 1 and an angle of 0. Uh, so you could express it, I guess, as 1 equals 1 cosine of 0 plus i sine of 0, if you wanted to. Um, I'm not necessarily going to need to. Okay, I'm going to find the radius of all roots. Actually not ready for this chart thing yet. Radius of all roots is going to be the fourth root of 1, which is 1. Now, right, it's kind of weird because I said find the complex fourth roots of 1, and I already said I have found the fourth root of 1, but we know that 1 to the fourth is 1. That's the real, we'll say that's the, the real root, the primary real root of 1. Okay. Then, uh, I also know that theta is 0, so for uh, root 1, which I'm going to call uh, C1, I think our book uses Z. Yeah, they use Z for roots. I don't know why. I'm going to use C. C1 is going to have uh, theta 1 equal to uh, the original theta plus 2 pi k divided by 4, because I'm doing a fourth root, and k will be 0, right? So I'm going to think about counting up k. And this is kind of using that formula I just presented, if you want to. 
You don't have to use the formula. Um, all right, so how do I compute this? Well, theta 1 is going to be 0 plus 2 pi times 0 over 4, or 0. So the first root will have radius equal 1, theta equal 0. Um, guys, it's just equal to the number 1. Oh, okay. So that wasn't, that was not particularly strange. Uh, that was kind of expected. We already know the fourth root of 1 is 1. But here's where it gets interesting. The second root will have theta, theta 2 equal to 0 plus 2 pi divided by 4, right? So I'm doing 2 pi times 1 divided by 4. Now 2 pi divided by 4 is something interesting. That's pi over 2. So the second radius is still 1, but the second theta is pi over 2. I could put that in uh, polar form, but I think it's actually easiest to just put it into rectangular form right away. That's the number i, right? What number is one unit away from zero at a pi over two radius? It's i. Okay. Complex root number three is going to have theta three equal to zero plus not zero, not two pi, but 4 pi, right? So I'm just going to add on now 4 pi divided by 4. That's going to equal pi. So I'm going to have the third radius is still 1, but the third angle is pi. What number has an angle of pi and a radius of 1 on the complex plane? That's negative 1. And the fourth root, the fourth fourth root, that is, we'll have the fourth angle equal to 0 plus 6 pi and then divided by 4, right? So I'm doing the, the, the coterminals of 0, then dividing them by 4 because it's the fourth root. Uh, that's going to be 6 pi over 4. So it's really nice that it was 0 over here. I don't have to do much work, which is 3 pi over 2. So that's going to be the angle. So R3 is 1. Theta, nope, r4 is 1. Theta 4 is 3 pi over 2. What does that number look like? Oh, it's negative i on the complex plane. So the complex fourth roots of 1 are 1, i, negative 1, and negative i. And it is true for all of these that 1 to the 4th is 1. It's also true that i to the 4th is 1. It's also true that negative 1 to the 4th is 1. And it's also also true that negative i to the 4th is 1. And that's why these are the four solutions, or we would call them the four roots of unity. And I want to show you something else that's really cool. And I kind of started to do it. I think I can squeeze it up in the corner here. When you sketch these roots out in the complex plane, there's one at 1, there's one at i, there's one at negative 1, and there's one at negative i. And notice that they're separated by exactly... 90 degrees, and that's not a coincidence at all. Always, this is something that's going to happen. In fact, we might, we're going to go back to the last couple problems and, and study this. It's not separated by 90 degrees. Specifically, it's that it takes the kind of full circle and divides it into four equal parts, which makes each of those uh, roots be separated by 90 degrees. So if I go back to the problem I did, you know, 20 minutes ago, and I look at the roots that I got there, uh, which were the cube roots of 8, is what I was trying to find in this problem. If I sketch out those cube roots of 8, I had 2. I had negative 1 plus i root, so 2 looked like this. Negative 1 plus i root 3 looked, up, looked like this. And negative 1, uh, no it doesn't, I don't know how to draw. There. 
Negative 1 plus i root 3 looked like that. And root 3 isn't, yeah, that's about right. And I also had negative 1 minus i root 3. And notice that the angular separation between each of these roots is uh, 2 pi over 3. 2 pi over 3. 2 pi over 3, which actually kind of might hint at you a shortcut. I did all of this work to find the last root. I'd already found two of them, one by coincidence and one because it was equal to 2. And knowing 2, I could have identified that this is the angular separation, and I could have just added 2 pi over 3 to this angle to find those. So that actually is a trick, and I will use that often um, when I'm you know doing these for fun. But it's something that's really cool, and it's actually why I think these are so beautiful, is that they really do have that kind of uh, arrangement around the complex plane. So you can use that to, that trick to solve. You can also just use it as a check, right? If you, if you have your roots and you plot them out, and they don't look like they're in kind of a nice arrangement, a nice symmetric uh, setup, you've done something wrong. It's a good self-check. All right, we're going to do three more problems. Um, I'm actually going to just cut the video here because we're at 45 minutes. And I'm going to do these problems in a separate video.